excited to talk about the Transcaimed and Lumbar Fusion um, uh, or the Opti Lift or uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, but um, honestly, this procedure has really changed my practice. I've been um, in practice since 2013 in private practice. I do mostly the gin spine um, and um, do pretty much all the typical approaches, a lift lateral, T loves, et cetera, um, and do, you know, MIS surgery to deformity correction. So um, really think that the transcambin approach has modified my practice. Uh, so I've been doing it since 2016 and um, it's, it's quite an interesting procedure because it's uh, super easy, super minimally invasive and really has a variety of different ways uh, that I think it can benefit your practice anywhere from just your um, standard uh, single level lumbar fusion cases um, to you know complex deformity and even revision surgery that sometimes can be extremely challenging. So i um, excited to just kind of introduce this procedure uh, to you. Transcaman approach is a little unique um, in that it is a little intimidating because it definitely is a different uh, approach um, and not something that we're really used to. Um, it, I would call it more of a lateral approach, um, but it is posterior um, uh, to the, or I guess in the anterior column. So you're coming anterior to the facet joints, uh, but posterior to the nerve root through the Cayman's triangle. Um, and if you do any endoscopic surgery, it's a very similar uh, targeting approach that we use um, to, to get into this uh, area. And believe it or not, even in the most um, bone on bone discs, it's, it's pretty easy to get into because you just have to introduce a guide pen. And once you get the guide pen in there, um, it's very straightforward. So um, the, the portal itself that you um, do all your instruments and the discectomy through is seven millimeters. So those diagrams there shows the average size of, of Cambin's triangle and where the portal would fit into that disc space. Um, but basically uh, by the exiting nerve root and the traversing nerve root. And um, then you've got your inferior end plate um, that is the inferior border of the, of the triangle. Um, so targeting, I think if you've ever done endoscopic, it's very similar, um, but targeting I think is really the most um, challenging thing to the procedure. And once you understand how to get there, everything else is a routine. Um, besides instruments being a little different, it's pretty routine disc prep and, and, and inner body insertion that you would do for any fusion. So um, I uh, usually take an AP x-ray and like the um, diagram says there, just kind of mark out your inferior end plate of that disc space. Um, and the training, um, tools say measure pedicle to pedicle and then you'll go that same length offline honestly it ends up being about eight centimeters offline uh, off midline almost every time so i go eight to ten centimeters offline depending on how um how the body habitus is the patient the bigger the patient the usually a little bit more lateral you'll go um but uh, this technique also works very well but um, so you'll go about eight centimeters off midline, and then that will be your incision and, um, and entry point. And, um, you know, it says make the centimeter incision. I mean, the portal is only seven millimeters. The distal end of the portal is a little bigger, so it's one centimeter is, um, is pretty generous. I mean, you don't even have to really make an incision that big, which I think is the beauty of this procedure, as it really is uh, placing the spacer through a teeny incision. Um, but you'll go um, navigate to tra uh, Cayman's Triangle with neuromonitoring. Um, so that pic this picture kind of depicts the um, neuromonitoring probe that comes in the set. Um, there's a second one that's a little different too, if you have trouble using this one, um, but uh, very similar to like a first dilator that you would use in a lateral. Um, but uh, you'll, mon uh, well, you'll, you'll target the entry to the Cayman's Triangle and then stem to ensure that you are not um, uh, super close to the nerve. I usually stem at five and just make sure I'm not getting any um, five milliamps and not sure I'm getting any feedback there. And then you can introduce that into the disc space. So this is how it'll look on the AP X-ray. Um, you can target the middle of the disc space. This particular picture is showing at the bottom end plate. 
um, in a big juicy disc like this, which we normally never operate on, you might want to target more midline. Um, but the point is you just want to be as far away from that uh, exiting nerve root as possible. And the lower you are in the foramen, the further away from that nerve root you are. So um, this is a very safe uh, point and you want that first entry point on the disc space to be um, somewhere within the lateral border to the medial border of the pedicle. You just don't want to be obviously medial to the medial border of the pedicle to make sure you're not in the canal uh, as a starting point. But this is the perfect starting point, which is on the lateral edge of the pedicle and if you're part of the disc space. And uh, then at this point, assuming that there are no problems with neuromonitoring, monitoring, you would introduce uh, the probe into the disc space. And um, typically at that point, I would do a lateral x-ray just to confirm um, like this picture shows, and then introduce that um, dilator. And then you'll uh, typically place that 50% 50, um, 50 into the disc. And if it's 50% on the lateral, it's 50% on the AP or dead center in the middle of the disc. And that is the most perfect positioning um, that you can really get as, um, as uh, where you would introduce your portal. So at, that, at, at, at this x-ray, you would then introduce the second dilator and then the portal uh, which is shown in this picture. So it's just uh, three steps. And then once, like I said, once you have this portal in, it's really easy peasy from there. So um, since you are coming in oblique, the distal end of the portal is going to look like an oval. And that trailing edge, you want it about five millimeters recess into the disk space. So you're safe. You're, you know, a few millimeters in. Uh, so when you do deploy the implant, it is receding into the disk space. So once you have the portal um, like this, you'll take out the second dilator, uh, dock your portal down to the skin, and you're ready to begin the disc prep. Um, this is an animation that just kind of shows you um, how this looks three-dimensionally. It's kind of a cool um, animation video, but that just shows you Cayman's triangle, um, <clears throat> how that is in relation to where you would go through the skin. Uh, it's the first dilator, uh, the neuromonitoring probe is the white one, and then the second dilator, and then the silver is the portal. Um, there is a, a quick track that usually goes over the skin to kind of hold it into place. And um, once you have that uh, and the portal is in, it's um, all, all the nerves are, are nowhere near where you're working. So um, you're pretty much safe to proceed with, with all the uh, further parts of the steps. Um, so the, there's a series of different tools in the um, OptiLift set um, that will help you evacuate the disc. Um, so the first step is typically this, just this drill, um, and that will help you just kind of ensure, uh, measure the size of the implant. So while you're doing your disc prep, the surgical tech could be loading that implant on the back table. So you'll drill this all the way across the disc space and then there is a measure on the portal that will tell you how deep you are to gauge whether or not you need a small, medium, or large implant. Um, and then um, the other, I think, Mike, there's some other, yes, yeah, the next step is typically the uh, shaper, um, which is basically goes in at seven millimeters, and then you'll slowly dial up that shaper. It's very similar to how a T-lift shaver looks. Um, but it'll slowly open up and you can spin it clockwise to morselize the disk space. Um, and then you can open it to size to see um, uh, to, to see how much um, disk you need and kind of feel. There's good tactile feel back of where, when that's uh, peeling that um, cartilaginous inflate off. Um, and usually in a very normal disk where you have a convexity at the center of the disk, you can open it a little more in the middle so you can really decorticate the center of the disc and close it down when you're a little bit deeper um, into that lateral edge of the disc. Um, so, so that's usually the second second step. And there's pituitary, so I'll usually place pituitary in, pull out some disc remnants. There's some articulating curettes that are in the set, forwards, backwards, um, different sizes. It'll also help you peel off that end plate. Uh, and then the, this uh, instrument right here that is pictured, it is the um, a tissue extractor brush almost looks like a wire uh, rail brush if you want uh, to think of it that way, but it's got a little bend on it and it really, really helps evacuate that disc. So you'll place it in there with a striker, um, like a striker pie driver. It goes on 
Um, and I just spin that little thing around in the disk space, evacuates all the disk, and you get a, a extremely great uh, disk prep. And um, then the last step would be the verify balloon, which is kind of similar to like a Kyphon balloon if you've ever used that, but it's just got contrasted dye in there. So you can um, place into this place, uh, disk space and inflate it to see um, how much disk is gone. Um, this is showing the absolute perfect discectomy because you got clean end plates. Um, but um, if you did have a little ripple effect or somewhere, you know, there's a piece of disk that's still remnant in there and you can do some more work until you get it looking like this. Um, and at times, if you've got a patient with kind of maybe not the best bone, you might even see a little violation of the plate. Um, I wouldn't worry about that too much as long as just a small little minute uh, implant violation because the implant will really kind of uh, shape to that size. And um, what's great about this implant, in my opinion, is that, um, you know, even I, I, I've never, I think it just kind of fills all the three dimensionally crevices of the disc space uh, more so than a triangular implant. And um, I don't really see much subsidence of this implant. I think it's just because of that reason. It really does kind of morph into the end plates uh, like it's like a, a implant should. Um, so just another animation video showing the portal in place. And then um, this shows the depth I drill that I, that I said was a first step that helps you uh, measure. Um, second step would be the um, shaper. Um, so that's just kind of showing you morselizing another path than the articulating curettes. And you can even wand the portal back and forth to allow you to reach even deeper than what some of these instruments can do. Um, then the backwards articulating caret, which will help you really evacuate the proximal part of the disc, which is an excellent instrument that was added um, in the 2.0 set. And um, that just shows, you know, almost like an ALF sized discectomy through a seven millimeter portal. And, and the more you use these instruments, the more comfortable you get. And it really, um, really will give you um, an excellent uh, disc prep uh, for this procedure. Um, so once you're done with the Verify Balloon, um, then the implant goes in. Um, it is initially a collapsed um, just mesh bag. And then there are pre-filled tubes of DBM. Um, you can place sentinel graft, which I believe most surgeons do um, in my practice. Uh, because it is an anterior approach, I will place uh, BMP. I'll use an extra small BMP or a very small um, piece of infuse. Uh, through the portal after I do my disc right before I place my bag. So I'll place that little infused anterior and then, then place the bag and then backfill the bag so it expands like this. And then, um, and then you have your implant in position. Um, and then depending on the size of the balloon will depend, I'm um, excuse me, the size of the implant will depend on how many bags you will fill. Um, there's a minimum and max fill and a lot of the um, placing the bone graft is on tactile uh, feedback. So this just shows a video of uh, placing the bag and then after you deploy the uh, DBM cancellus allograft. And um, I um, didn't really understand how much indirect decompression you can get out of this implant um, until I really started utilizing it. It, was, it is really impressive how much indirect decompression. And I can show you hundreds of pictures of, of cases I've done where you'll get um, just the most amazing um, indirect decompression from this implant. And then over time, um, I love that last uh, little picture it showed of just the way um, that you'll get um, formation of bone across a fusion um, and ankylosis across the space um, over time. So um, that's a CT um, showing, I don't know how far that particular one is, but I would say that's at least probably 12 months out. Um, and I'll be honest, like initially when you get, I, I'm an over imager, I think it reassures me if a patient has some post-operative pain, obviously like not right off the bat, but if someone has some um, pain that they're concerned about, I image a lot um, just to kind of reassure myself, reassure them um, and make sure, you know, they think I'm taking their complaints seriously. But I've seen a lot of CTs, I guess is my point. And initially at that six month mark, three to six to nine month mark, you will get a little bit of um, resorption around the back. So you may not see the integration into the end plate like on this scan. And that's normal because the way, um, bone, this is not a titanium implant. This is a allograft um, bone implant. So the initial formation of bone is that you'll get some 
osteolysis of the bone while you're forming calcification of the, around the new newly laid bone. Um, so I usually do not get concerned about any haloing around the implant unless it is persistent beyond 12 to 18 months, or if I start to see gas around the bag or something like that um, later on um, beyond that initial time frame. I have seen some, uh, maybe two cases. I've done probably 500 or more implants. Um, may have seen two where I've had significant osteolysis of the implant that needed a second surgery, but I think the complication rate is tremendously less than the uh, traditional cages that I um, have used in the past for T-lifts. Um, and I, I wish I had given Mike some of my, you know, even 24, 48, got some four year patients out and just even the maturation of the implant over time just continues to get more and more bone growth to the point where almost you can't even disertain that there's even an implant anymore. And you'll just get solid bone growth across the entire space. And it really is quite, um, quite impressive. This is just the data on the um, <clears throat> on the um, uh, trial that was uh, submitted to the FDA when it recently got um, FDA approval for interbody use. Um, and that showed um, the data that's presented there. So I think selecting your first patient um, is important. I think this is a new procedure. And if you're not used to that approach or the targeting, um, the picking a slam dunk case is very important. And initially, not even your first case, but you know, the first five to 10 cases, I would just make sure it's a very simple case so you can um, learn and, and build yourself uh, to succeed because doing a challenging case may uh, be somewhat discouraging if you're not able to get the outcome that you want. So I think I saw a question come up a minute ago, but I, I didn't, I only saw a very snippet of it, so. Yeah. <clears throat> um... Thanks, Dr. Grunch. Uh, Dr. Chua wrote a question in the chat and Dr. Chua says, what percentage of your posterior fusion patients are you able to use this technique without being able to do any direct decompression? Um, so I think it, without doing direct decompression. So I would say that it really depends on um, a multitude of things, like somebody with um, severe stenosis, I, you know, wouldn't rely on an a left lateral or an opti lift to really do it alone. I think the same type of cases that you rely on indirect decompression, um, you'll get the same kind of outcome uh, from this implant. Um, but, you know, those moderate stenosis or maybe patients that have radicular pain only when ambulating or weight bearing and patients that don't have pain at, at rest, uh, with uh, mild to moderate stenosis are the ones that I really um, uh, rely on the indirect decompression or maybe just have, you know, radicular pain uh, periodically. Um, but um, it really is a pretty easy um, procedure, at least, you know, in my practice, I'll drop the opti mesh bag down the screws, rods, um, and then drop a metrics tube down at the end and decompress if I need to. So it doesn't really add a lot of time, maybe like 30 minutes, but need to decompress. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. All right. I'm going to go to some of the surgeons that could not attend tonight. Some of their questions. Um, so the first one is achieving lordosis and maintaining or restoring sagittal balance. How do you achieve that with the, the approach and with the OptiMesh implant? Um, that's a great question. I think that um, what you'll see, I mean, because it is a implant that kind of conforms to the disc space, um, a lot of surgeons have that concern. Well, how am I going to restore coronal imbalance, sagittal imbalance, get lordosis? Um, and I think, um, you know, because it does conform to the disc space, um, you'll get the ligaments will stretch and realign to their natural lordosis space for the most part. I mean, you know, if you have someone that's in a extreme kyphosis of a, of a disc space or really needs a, you know, 20 degrees or more correction, this is um, probably not the implant that you want to use. Uh, but for just restoration of natural uh, lordosis, it's intrinsic within the disc space itself. Um, almost every time I'm able to achieve that. And it is a, a little bit different of an approach. So it is 
because it is sort of a malleable type implant, um, you can, it's more of an art, I guess is uh, how I would say it. So if, I know if I want to achieve a lot of lordosis, I'll place the portal a little deeper so the implant is deport, deployed more anterior and um, I'll be able to blow up the bag pretty anterior so I can um, collapse down posteriorly on my screws um, in order to get the lordosis that I want to achieve so the implant doesn't just kind of spread out across the whole disc space. Um, or on the, same token, uh, on the same token, if you're trying to get a good coronal balance and let's say the disc is really collapsed on the right, but the left is very tall, I'll really try to place the portal so I can access and place the implant more off to that right side to get coronal imbalance. So um, it is something that's pretty easy to do. You just have to really be um, have an open mind and an artsy kind of mind to really make sure you place the implant where you want. And um, the more experience you have with using the implant, it really becomes very easy to do that. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go with another question from a surgeon out here in Arizona. So um, achieving fusion, assessing fusion, um, how do you, uh, you know, kind of look at the fusion? Uh, what are they? So it doesn't incorporate, um, the fusion doesn't look like your typical fusion. What do you- yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I for most surgeons, I think um, that monitor fusion with their patients usually get periodic x-rays. So at least in my practice, I'll get an immediate post-op x-ray. I'll get one at their first post-op visit, three months, six months, and 12 months, and, and even, you know, 18 to 24 months if they're having any issue. Um, so I do get a lot of films just to kind of monitor that status. And so how a, um, a titanium cage looks is you just look for subsidence, you look for hardware failure. Um, sometimes it's very challenging to see really bone growth across the fusion, across the disc space itself um, until later on where you get bone growth around the uh, inner body. But, um, and, and even at times that can even be challenging. So you're really just kind of looking at the implant itself. Um, but in this, it does appear to be very different. I mean, you're not gonna see really, you're gonna see like this, um, uh, hints of bone graft in the disc space. Um, so it does look different. Um, and I also use this implant for vertebral uh, compression fracture. So we also can see it on in the in a um, vertebral body the same way. But um, essentially, you know, that first x-ray, you're going to see a very dense bone because you got highly compacted allograft. Um, it's not going to be nowhere near the density of, say, a titanium case, but it'll look more like um, just a bone graft within the disc space itself. And then at your three and six and even nine month x-rays, if you get nine month x-rays, um, you may even see a little resorption like I mentioned, and that's very normal. Um, as long as you don't see any collapse of the disc space. And it's interesting because even though you're getting resorption of the disc space, you're not getting any collapse. And that's because there is bone formation that's happening. It's just not calcified bone that's being laid down yet. And then at that 12 months uh, x-ray, um, you may start to see more integration within the implants again it. Sometimes very hard to see on a plain x-ray, but you can definitely see it on CT. And then 18, 24, even 48 months out, um, the uh, ankylosis even continues on um, and it can be quite robust. Um, if you place that sentinel graft, that may be the first space to see um, the integration of the bone graft across the disc space. So um, in my uh, patients, usually I'll first start to see that ankylosis across the anterior part where I had laid down the BMP. And then I also decorticate posteriorly at the facet. So I look at that as well, but those, that's also hard to see. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Next uh, question is um, pertaining to uh, the, the DISPRAT. So I, I don't feel that I can achieve a thorough enough DISPRAT even though, Mike, you told me the new instruments uh, helped me achieve that, I don't believe I can get a thorough enough disc prep. Um, so that is definitely a um, different feel and a different approach to what a traditional disc prep is because normally you're used to seeing it, like on a, if you do a lateral, like looking down the tube, uh, a lift or a T lift or your, um, sorry, where you're actually um, 
visualizing your uh, and feeling, you know, your decortication. Um, but this is the same thing you just can't see. So it's all tactile feel. Um, the instruments are very easy to use. And it is, it's totally different. So some surgeons aren't gonna be comfortable with that because they're just used to the way they're traditionally doing the disc prep. Um, but I think the instruments in the set honestly give me more confidence of doing a better disc prep than what I can do on a traditional T lift. Um, and I can achieve the discectomy of what I do on an A lift or a lateral um, through that small little portal by wanding the instruments and really utilizing the instruments that are designed in the set to give you an excellent disc prep. And the best part about it is, is that really that confirmatory um, last step of the balloon, um, because it really will show you what you have. And, and it's uh, quite humbling sometimes to put that thing in there and think that you've done the best disrupt in the world. And then um, and then I need to show you that you hadn't. And um, I've also used the Verify balloon just on regular disc, uh, not even OptiLift sets, just to kind of give me um, an idea. And it's, and it's the same thing. It's quite humbling when you really think you do a uh, excellent disc prep, and then turns out you really haven't. Um, so I think all the tools that are in the set will really give you confidence to do that you can achieve a very thorough uh, discectomy, uh, much more so than than what you would get, which is a traditional uh, T lift. So, um, and then the last question that I have from attendees that couldn't attend. Um, ASC versus inpatient usage. Are you performing these procedures mainly on an inpatient basis, outpatient basis? Um, both. So um, in, my in my opinion, like really this is the most um, best use, I guess, of an uh, inner body fusion in the outpatient setting. Um, I do them at my ASC and send patients home the same day. Um, with the less tissue disruption. Um, and, you know, even if I do a decompression, these patients just do so well with the use of Expiril. And I also place epidural um, steroids and, and fentanyl or Duramorph. And um, I really don't have a lot of pain, um, uh, you know, as because you're not really doing a lot of bony work. Um, you don't have to do that, you know, taking down the lamin and the facets and stuff. There's not a lot of bleeding. Um, and so they, they really don't get a lot of pain from this. Um, so I think it does shine in the ASC setting more so than any other implant on the market. Uh, but on that same token, I mean, I use them all the time in my deformity and scoli cases. So, you know, if I have a, a, uh, a patient that I'm doing a tend to pelvis on, um, I usually do a lifts at five, one, just because that's my go-to, um, and even at four five, but if I've got a, a chronal imbalance or a sagittal imbalance, um, I can throw in, you know, an OptiMesh at L1234 uh, in like, you know, 45 minutes, three inner bodies uh, to give really great anterior column support uh, and strength to the construct. So, um, so I use it in both settings as a short answer. <laughs> and thank you. One last question came in. So for, for Spondies, what's your cutoff? Probably a grade two. I mean, these these aren't hard in grade one spondies at all. I get great reduction of grade one spondy. It can be challenging just to introduce a portal with that nerve root being pulled forward in a grade two. Um, I've done it, um, but you know it, it can present a challenge. And I really, you know, I think a good grade two spondy needs an ALA for a lateral, probably anyway, just to get good. Uh, those are just bad cases all the way around, which are really uncommon, but. Um, I think those are very unstable usually too. So, um, I just, um, uh, prefer to not use OptiMesh in those cases. Um, I will say also too, just to kind of keep in mind, I mean, these are not your kind of cases that you want to start using the OptiLift on. Um, but I really also think that this is one of the best implants to supplement a pseudoarthrosis. So, um, it's probably one of my favorite applications. If you've got a patient that had a T-Lift. Um, and let's say they have an inner body off to the right side and they've got a clear pseudo. And uh, what do you do in that case, especially if it's like three, four or, or two, three, where maybe you can't come anterior to remove that cage, um, but you can really just place a portal in and drop a OptiMesh bag right beside that um, inner body spacer. Um, uh, and it, it can be a very easy way to fix a pseudoarthrosis in those cases that are sometimes 
almost seemingly impossible to manage. Um, and, um, yeah, and I've even salvaged um, some pseudo cases like in Scully that I mentioned where, um, let's say, you know, the patients had a tender pelvis, but they've uh, had continued pain and say we got some vacuum disc phenomena on one of the discs where you know there's some motion. Um, you can even drop an OptiMesh bag through a tiny little incision um, and uh, salvage your hardware if they haven't had a hardware fracture yet um, to, to, um, to provide some anterior column th support through a very easy approach. Um, so those are really cool applications of the implant too that I think make it very unique.